Okay, so uh, we talked about various levels of control that one can have, and what one uses to control microbes are antimicrobial agents. These are uh, chemicals or drugs or physical things that have some sort of effect on microbes, usually a negative one. And they share some properties generally in common, so let's talk about that for a second. So the ideal properties of an antimicrobial agent is it should be effective. It should be very good at getting rid of or controlling microbes. It should be inexpensive uh, because you're probably going to have to use a lot of it. Non-toxic. Uh, that's really both to humans and the environment, though I've separated them out. But uh, if you're going to be using it on things or in environments that people are going to be, or possibly even on people, then it shouldn't be hurting those people. Uh, it should be environmentally safe, so that you can dispose of it in a cheap and easy manner without destroying the environment. It should work quickly, uh, because sometimes you don't have a whole lot of time to control microbes. It should be non-caustic, by which I mean uh, that if you use it on some sort of physical object like a surface or a uh, tool, that it should not damage that object. And it should be stable during storage, so that you can store it and transport it for a uh, long time without worrying about whether or not it's gone bad, or it becoming dangerous or anything like that. So when you use a, uh, a, a chemical or a physical manifestation to control microbes, it doesn't work instantly. Some take a short amount of time to work, some take a long amount of time to work, but they all take time to work. And uh, they usually start working right away, but they're not going to finish working until sometime later. And the microbes that you're using it on are all going to be variously resistant. In any microbial prop, uh, population, some microbes are going to be more resistant, some microbes are going to be less resistant. Some microbes are just going to be lucky and not get killed all that quickly. So what we have is a plot of microbial death rates. And uh, generally speaking, when you first apply your control element, you start killing off a lot of microbes at a go. Usually every minute or every time increment, you're killing 90% of them. So, uh, you know, if there's a billion microbes out there, and in the first time increment, you're going to be killing uh, 900 million of them. In the second time increment, you're going to be killing 90 million of them. In the third, you're going to be killing 9 million. In the fourth, you're going to be killing 900,000. So you can see that as time goes on, you're killing less and less and less. It's the same fraction, but you're killing less microbes total. So if you need to reduce your microbial population to uh, below 1% of its starting value, then that's pretty easy. You can do that fairly quickly. Uh, but usually, if you want to do a very rigorous job of controlling microbes, you need to reduce them below like 0.01% or whatever standard you're going to. And uh, that can take more time. So even with bleach, and we'll talk about this later, but even with bleach, um, it kills most of the microbes right away, but in order to achieve, like, true maximal effect from bleach, you're supposed to leave the bleach in contact with microbes for 10 minutes or more. That means you've gone 10 time increments, and you've decreased it from, uh, uh, you know, trillions of cells to less than 100 or so. And uh, because just like microbes grow exponentially, these killing agents kill 
logarithmically. So they start off killing a whole lot, and then they get less and less and less and less and less as time goes on. So the way the antimicrobial agents work is, uh, well, they're going to do damage of some sort or another. And there's a few very common places for them to do damage. The first off is uh, cell walls. There are a lot of antimicrobial agents, especially drugs and antibiotics, that interfere with cell walls. This is pretty good, pretty useful, because microbes, well, bacteria at least, have cell walls of peptidoglycan, and you don't. So that can be a way that um, you can very safely kill bacteria without harming humans. Uh, if you get rid of the cell wall, cells usually burst. Uh, they require those cell walls to maintain integrity. Um, so another thing that you can target is membranes. Now everything's got membranes, so this is going to be very universally effective. Cell walls is only going to be effective against things that have cell walls, so it's not going to be effective against, you know, many forms of fungi, lots of protozoa, any virus, but pretty much everything has membranes. Except things like naked viruses, prions, and uh, while bacterial endospores do have membranes, they're not as reliant on them. Um, so this is going to be a, a pretty reasonable level of control. Uh, it's going to affect most things, but not everything. Uh, so things that disrupt membranes are going to be usually things that have hydrophobic properties. Uh, often that have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties, so they can bind to the membranes and make the membranes stop associating with each other, and that basically pokes a hole or it pops the cell. And uh, then the, the cytoplasm sort of spills out, and the cell can no longer maintain its integrity. Uh, so non-enveloped or naked viruses have a greater tolerance to harsh conditions. Um, a lot of things, specifically, you know, what we talked about here, things that uh, alter cell walls or that alter cell membranes aren't going to affect naked viruses. They're also typically not going to affect endospores, and they may or may not affect fungal cells. So another uh, way that cells can, uh, or the antimicrobial agents can work, is damage to proteins and nucleic acids. So damage to proteins is very common. Uh, proteins are pretty universal. Everything's got proteins. Bacterial cells have proteins, fungal cells have proteins, even viruses and prions have proteins. So anything that's going to damage or denature proteins uh, is going to be pretty effective. Of course, the problem is that you have proteins too. So anything that damages and denatures proteins is probably not going to be very hospitable to you. Uh, and you can either actually damage the protein itself like actually tear it apart, rip it to shreds, that works fine. Uh, or you can denature it, which means that you haven't actually destroyed the protein, but you've made it the wrong shape. And since its function is dependent upon its 3D shape, uh, that means that you've basically you've destroyed the function of that protein. And this is also very common. Uh, but these are going to work in slightly different ways. So, um, heat and certain chemicals, particularly hydrophobic chemicals, so proteins fold so that they have the hydrophobic bits inside and the hydrophilic bits outside, and if you put them in a hydrophobic solution, it causes them to fold wrong. And heat does the same thing uh, through a different way. It excites the protein and it makes the protein move faster, and it eventually starts moving so fast that it, like, can't keep its insides on the inside anymore, and it pops open. Now, other chemicals, like harsh abrasive chemicals, 
uh, bleach, uh, highly reactive chemicals like peroxides will actually break proteins in half so that they, um, they, they no longer have the right linear structure and then they're completely kaput. And the, the chemical bonds have been broken and they're no longer functional at all. Um, nucleic acids, heat doesn't do a whole lot to them. I mean, you can boil nucleic acids and they are fine. Uh, they melt, but they're pretty good at finding their way back together into the proper shape. Um, on the other hand, mutagenic chemicals uh, and radiation are fairly good at destroying nucleic acids. And uh, the way to know whether or not something is working to destroy nucleic acids is to ask yourself, is this a mutagen? Like, is this a cancer-causing agent? And if yes, then yeah, it'll probably cause mutations in bacteria or viruses or whatever, and those mutations will accumulate and will kill it. Again, that often makes them less friendly to humans. So radiation does a great job at killing bacteria. It also does an okay job at, you know, killing humans. So it's something that you have to watch out for. Now, fortunately, radiation doesn't stick around. So you can zap an area with radiation, kill all the microbes in it, and it's completely safe after you've turned the radiation off for humans because the radiation doesn't doesn't stay there, it just kills and it goes away. Um, and mutations can work two ways. It can either affect DNA or it can affect RNA. And either one will pretty much work. Affecting DNA is more permanent. If you turn off protein synthesis through uh, shutting down RNA, you're going to certainly stop the cell from growing, so that would be bacteria static. But you're going to have to keep it up for a certain amount of time if you want it to be bactericidal. Because just getting rid of protein production or getting rid of RNA isn't going to kill bacteria right away. It's going to take a bit of time before that has an effect. So when you are considering uh, what sort of antimicrobial or what sort of control method you're going to use, there are some factors to keep in mind. So, we talked about the ideal properties of an antimicrobial earlier, and the truth is that nothing is really perfect. We don't have anything that has all of those qualities. Uh, if we did, we'd just use that all the time. But the ones that are, you know, really good tend to be toxic to humans, or they're really expensive. Uh, some of them work on some things, but not others. So, basically, the first thing that you're going to consider is what you need to be treating, right? If what you need to be exerting control over is living or dead, that's going to make a huge difference how you tackle it. Uh, if it's a liquid or a solid, that's going to make a big difference. So, sterilizing water, you go about that a very different way than if you were sterilizing a needle. Because, uh, well, some things are going to work fine on both of them, some things are not. You can filter water. You can't really filter a needle. Uh, you also have to take into account, whether it's a solid or a liquid, what the effect of what you're doing to it will be. So, if you want to sterilize a liquid, adding bleach to it might be a fine idea. Uh, but if you then want to go use that liquid later, well, you can't get the bleach back out of the water very easily. On the other hand, if you soak, say, a piece of metal in bleach, you can take it out and you can wash it off. So that's probably fine. But there are some things, certain plastics, certain other materials, that might be damaged by the bleach. Or by the whatever. By the alcohol, by the phenols, by the radiation, perhaps. Uh, you also want to consider, for instance, so um, hot water, heat, wet heat, is a very common uh, way to sterilize or to uh, decontaminate objects. Some things take 
water very well. For instance, it's very effective against uh, anything that starts off being water already. I mean, it's already water, so the water's not going to hurt it. On the other hand, if you've got a stack of papers that need to be sterilized, well, you can't exactly boil papers. It wouldn't work. It would destroy them. So you want to consider what the effect of your antimicrobial agent is going to be on the object. You also want to consider what level of control you need. Do you really need sterilization? Is an antiseptic enough? Is a disinfectant enough? Maybe, you know, maybe a simple degerming procedure would be totally sufficient for what you're doing. So, uh, you, you choose your method of control based off of the physical properties of what you're dealing with, what effects your antimicrobial will have on your object, uh, what level of control you need, and also your time and budget constraints. Because some things take more time than others, some things are more expensive than others. So, uh, we have different terms for uh, particularly chemicals that exert different levels of control. So, uh, germicides, here are germicides, these have high, intermediate, or low effectiveness. That means that basically germicide, side means to kill, these kill germs. Um, they could kill germs really well, or they could kill germs not so well. And so we'll talk about high-level germicides, intermediate-level germicides, or low-level germicides. And high-level germicides are basically sterilants. These kill all pathogens, including endospores. Now, it does technically say all pathogens. So there might be, they, not all high-level germicides will necessarily be sterilants, but they're all going to be pretty close. And they're all going to be sufficient for most circumstances. They also tend to be pretty toxic and kind of expensive. Intermediate level germicides kill fungal spores, protozoan cysts, viruses, and pathogenic bacteria. These are pretty good. These are the, the better type of disinfectant. Uh, fungal spores and protozoan cysts are, are sort of like tough uh, fungi and protozoa, it's usually their reproductive form, uh, and it is how they avoid damage, so anything that kills them is going to be pretty nasty. Viruses, and this means all sorts of viruses, both naked and enveloped. And pathogenic bacteria, but not endospores. So active, vegetatively growing pathogenic bacteria. Low-level uh, control methods, low-level germicides, kill vegetative bacteria. Vegetative, you usually think of like vegetables or things that grow. So vegetative means growing, actively growing, reproducing. It means the sort of bacteria that's not in like hibernation or an endospore or something like that. So vegetative bacteria, fungi and protozoa, but not fungal spores and protozoal cysts. And some viruses, usually enveloped viruses. So low-level germicides are, mm, you know, not that useful. These are usually going to be stuff that you would find in Walmart, uh, you know, in the cleaning section. So this is going to be, you know, Lysol, um, house cleaners, uh, things that are, are usually sufficient for cleaning the home, but probably not sufficient for cleaning any, um, any place like a hospital or a place where you might want to exert a, a higher level of control. So lots of things affect the uh, efficiency of antimicrobial chemicals, chemicals in specific. Uh, and one of the big ones is heat. 
uh, heat is usually going to decrease the amount of time that it takes to reduce the number of organisms. So remember uh, earlier we talked about uh, how you're getting rid of 90% of the bacteria every time step. Well, a time step we usually think of as being a minute, but it can change. So maybe at room temperature, so something like 20 degrees, 20 degrees is a little bit less than room temperature, uh, you're getting rid of 90% of the bacteria every minute. But if you raise the temperature to 45 degrees, this is really, really hot. Um, this is probably hotter than it gets uh, on anywhere except maybe like Phoenix, you know, or big deserts or something like that, as far as naturally. But you can certainly heat water and you can heat areas to 45 degrees. Um, then you might be killing... 90% of the bacteria every 20 seconds. So it's decreasing the length of your time step. This is true of temperature. Uh, other things can also affect the efficacy of antimicrobial chemicals. For instance, bleach works very well in uh, on non-organic things. So it works great for like surfaces. Uh, but if you put it into an organic solution, or any place that has a lot of organic residue in it, that, that organic residue is going to decrease the effectiveness of the bleach. Um, this is true for peroxide as well, uh, and uh, a, a lot of other chemicals. So um, the temperature is a big factor. Ox, uh, oxygen presence can be a big factor, although that's kind of hard to control. Uh, and um, the presence of organic matter can be a big factor. All of these things are things that you want to keep in mind when you're figuring out how much control for how long and what level of control have I established. So I have a little quiz here. Uh, the question is, what agent of control would be ineffective against naked viruses? So take a few minutes to look this over. Go ahead and pause the uh, video, and I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, so the agents of control that would be ineffective against naked viruses are membrane destabilization. So naked viruses basically have genomic material, and protein. And that's it. They have nucleic acids and protein. Well, protein denaturation is going to work just fine because they have protein, and genetic damage is going to work because they do have a genome. They do have nucleic acids. So both of those would work fine. The only one that would be ineffective is membrane destabilization because these are, uh, are naked viruses. They don't have membranes. They don't have anything that would be affected by that. Uh, so that's it for this, and I will see you in a moment for uh, chemical methods of organism control.